Sex in Britain at the end of the 1950s resembled in many ways the sex D.H. Lawrence knew and hated in Britain in the 1920s. Official morality was fighting to stay Victorian. One vicar gained brief fame by trying to make Soho strippers keep some of their clothes on. But there was a darker side to the establishment's repressive morality. There was indeed a moral purge uh, uh, in Britain. The Home Secretary then, who became Lord Kilmuir, instituted a drive against homosexuals, and um, the result was that not only were there a number of sensational prosecutions uh, of people for homosexual offences, uh, but a lot of perfectly respectable publishers suddenly found themselves in the dock in the Old Bailey, uh, guilty of having published an obscene book. I mean, a book which today would be regarded as the mildest and mildest of, of books. So that was the atmosphere which led up to Roy Jenkins uh, taking the initiative as a private member of introducing his bill on obscenity. The 1959 Obscene Publications Act for the first time allowed a publisher to defend a book on the grounds that it had literary merit. And for the first time, expert witnesses could be called by the defence. The trial of Penguin's unexpurgated version of Lady Chatterley's Lover was a test case for the new act. The atmosphere in court was electric. It was electric from start to finish. There wasn't a moment when uh, you couldn't hear a pin drop. There wasn't a moment of lack of attention by anybody. Uh, the public interest in the case was uh, enormous. It was never off the headlines of the evening newspapers. The nature of the prosecution case was entirely devised by Mervyn Griffith Jones, who was prosecuting. He did two things which were a great mistake. He said that the story in the book was mere padding for the sexual episodes. Now, it's only a gross misreading of Lady Chatterley's Lover which could lead one to that conclusion. Secondly, he said that it placed promiscuity upon a pedestal, and by saying that, he uh, appeared to criticise Lawrence's fundamental thesis that lies within the book. Uh, he had not read and could not have been expected to read the essays that Lawrence wrote about sexuality and about the liberation of women uh, or the uh, hoped-for liberation of women, and we were able to hoist him on a petard each one of the witnesses was asked one after another, do you agree that this place is promiscuity upon a pedestal? Oh no, they said, uh, in a single voice. These matters are not voiced normally in this court, but when it forms the whole subject matter of the prosecution, then, members of the jury, we cannot avoid voicing them. The word fuck or fucking occurs no less than 30 times. I have added them up. But I cannot guarantee that I have added them all up. Cunt, 14 times. Balls, 13 times. Shit and ass, 6 times apiece. Cock, 4 times. Piss, 3 times. And so on. I think most people, after the first day or two of the trial, felt fascinated at watching uh, Griffiths Jones because he was, in that way, manifestly a kind of throwback to an earlier age, and that it was it was not it was not a, a battle between youth and age or emancipation and and restriction. It was actually a battle between two eras. The heart of the defence case rested on the testimony of some of the most famous writers and critics of the time, including the Sunday Times film critic, Dillis Powell. I regard Lady Chatterley's Lover as an extremely moral book. A great proportion of the books I read, and the films I see, and the television I watch, seems to have a degrading influence. 
and a great deal of contemporary cinema seems to degrade the whole sanctity of sex, treating it as something trivial. But in Lawrence's book, which has great elements of sacredness, sex is taken as being something to be taken seriously and as a basis for a holy life. Did I hear you right? That sex is treated on a holy basis in this book? Yes. I still laugh when I, I think of his horrified face and things I said. I mean, I, I did say that uh, I thought there was something holy about his writing or something holy about what he said. And I still remember, he sort of said, oh, thank you, in sort of absolute disgust and shut up, you know. And I, think, I think he really believed, he really believed, I think, that he was arguing on the side of the gods, you know, and the serious good people. And I think he was absolutely uh, horrified at the reaction of so many perfectly serious and apparently more or less well-educated people towards a writer whom he personally, I think, thought was on the side of the bad, on the side of the evil. We all thought he was on the side of the good. The best-known woman at the time defending Lady Chatterley was the novelist Dame Rebecca West. The story of Lady Chatterley was designed from the first as an allegory. Here was a culture that had become sterile and unhelpful to man's deepest needs. And Lawrence wanted to have the whole of civilization realizing that it was not living fully enough that it would be exploited in various ways if it did not try to get down to the springs of its being and live more fully and bring its spiritual gifts into play. Clifford Chatterley and his impotence are a symbol of the impotent culture of his time. The love affair with the gamekeeper was a calling, a return of the soul to the more intense life that he felt when people had had a different culture, such as the cultural basis of a religious faith. It was very fascinating, because as the trial developed, it became evident that there was a sort of class struggle going on in the courtroom. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, Mr. Mervyn Griffiths-Jones uh, who represented uh, all the best in Eton and Oxford, and finding himself up against some very curious figures on the other side, ranging from E.M. Forster to the young Richard Hoggart, who at that time, I think, was an extramural lecturer at uh, Leicester. I think the defence witnesses were very carefully chosen to make a sort of stage army of different kinds of people. And the one thing they wanted to avoid were the uh, obviously permissive way out let it all happen, uh, 60s, early 60s people. You couldn't have had Kenneth Tynan on, because he obviously represented that anarchic streak. So we were a very sober-suited lot, you know, middle-aged, middle-class ladies in sensible tweeds from Oxbridge and all that stuff. Oh, I am sure I was cast as the working-class provincial who made good and read books, and uh, in a sense was like a, a tiny simulacrum of Lawrence himself. <coughs> Richard Hoggart was much younger than most of the academic witnesses, indeed most of the witnesses that we called. Uh, he came from a working class background. Uh, he was immensely articulate. He did not care how many times he used one of the four-letter words. In fact, he liberally sprinkled his evidence with four-letter words, which Mervyn Griffith Jones in particular found very, very distasteful. But he spoke, um, in a sense, for the common man. The prosecutor came on and went on at me in that awful bully way that they train British QCs in, and which they'd better get rid of quick. And he um, started suggesting, reading dirty bits, as he called them, and that in itself is an English phrase, and he said, um, 
would you think I said something to I thought it was a moral book and he, he then read what he thought of the dirty bits and said would you call that moral and I kept saying yes 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 and nothing on earth would have made me say yes 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 against a man like that and then I, 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 I pushed the boat out in a way that I hadn't realised I was going to do it was all quite unpremeditated I said it's not something like this it's not only moral it's positively puritanical and I thought oh god what have I said what a thing to say what a thing to defend you described this book as highly virtuous, if not puritanical. Please do not think I'm suggesting it with any bad faith against you. That is your considered view, is it? Yes. I thought I'd lived all my life under a misapprehension as to the meaning of the word puritanical. Will you help me? Yes. Many people do live their lives under a misapprehension of the meaning of the word puritanical. This is the way the language decays. In England today, and for a long time, the word puritanical has been extended to mean somebody who is against anything which is pleasurable, particularly sex. The proper meaning of it to a, a literary man or to a linguist is somebody who belongs to the tradition of British Puritanism generally. And the distinguishing feature of that is an intense sense of responsibility for one's conscience. In this sense, this book is puritanical. Do you find anything comparable to the matter discussed in the sex passages, uh, to the way in which it is being discussed, in Milton's Paradise Lost? Well, I should not expect to, because Paradise Lost is a poem about the creation of the world. Just look at page 178. This is one of Mellor's bouts. It is too long to read it all. This time, the sharp ecstasy of her own passion did not overcome. She lay with her hands inert on his striving body, and do what she might, her spirit seemed to look on from the top of his head, and the butting of his haunches seemed ridiculous to her, and the sort of anxiety of his penis to come to its little evacuating crisis seemed farcical. Yes, this was love. This ridiculous bouncing of the buttocks and the wilting of the poor, insignificant, moist little penis. It was quite true, as some poets said, that the God who created man must have had a sinister sense of humour, creating him a reasonable creature and then forcing him to take this ridiculous posture. I do not know. But is that, in your view, a recommendation for a Puritan literary and general standing? To drag God's name, the Creator's name, into a passage such as that? It is. The point here again is that for Lawrence, the physical act is meaningless unless it relates to one's whole being. In other words, back to God. And since you ask me, in the middle of Paradise Lost, there is a great passage in which Adam and Eve come together in this way in relation to God and it is highly sensual. And then, at that moment, he lost. And I realised, even as I was standing there, that he had lost. He'd lost his cool. Because he then, the only thing he could say after that was, uh, oh, uh, well, thank you for that lecture, but you're not at Leicester University now. Well, that kind of cheap crack indicated that he lost his grip on the, on the discussion. And from then on, it was, it was easy sailing. But it was a very, I, I've made it sound short, it was a very long session. It was, I think, over two and a half hours. And now she touched him. And it was the sons of God with the daughters of men. Her hands come timorously down his back to the soft, smallish globes of the buttocks. Beauty. How was it possible this beauty here, where she had previously only been repelled? The unspeakable beauty to the touch of the warm living buttocks. The life within life, the sheer warm potent loveliness, and the strange weight of the balls between his legs. What mystery, what a strange heavy weight of mystery that could lie soft and heavy in one's hand, the root root of all that is lovely, the primeval root of all full beauty. Perhaps that is enough. That again, I assume you say, is puritanical. It is puritanical in its reverence. 
What? Reverence to the balls. Reverence to the weight of a man's balls. Indeed, yes. What about tenderness? Is that a theme which it is in the public good to read as expressed in this book? In the words of the book itself. Tenderness. Really, cunt tenderness. Sex is really the closest touch of all. Cunt tenderness. That is the tenderness that this book is advocating through the mouth of one of its chief characters. And may I again quote from my notes? I believe in something. Oh, this is Mellor speaking. I believe in being warm-hearted. I believe that if men could fuck with warm hearts and women took it warm-heartedly, everything would come all right. Does it justify it? I ask you to bring to bear upon this matter your knowledge of the world and of the life which the average person leads. I respectfully submit to you that the effect upon that average person must be to deprave and corrupt, must be to lower the general standards of thought, conduct and decency and must be the very opposite to encouraging that restraint in sexual matters which is so all-important at the present time. There was, of course, a reaction from those who very much hated the book, notably by the Warden of All Souls, John Sparrow, who wrote a famous article in Encounter saying that uh, the witnesses had been guilty of the grossest humbug um, because they knew perfectly well that there was a famous indecent passage in the book to which they never alluded. Of course, the passage he was thinking of was the one in which um, Connie is being buggered by Mellors. Uh, it created a sensation, the article, um, but I must say, it was quite untrue, you know. There was no humbug at all. Uh, two of the witnesses, Graham Huff and Joan Bennett, raised that very point with Gerald Gardner before the trial and um, said, what do we say if this is put to us? And Gardner simply said, well, of course, is there not another interpretation? You could interpret this passage as Mellor's having perfectly normal sexual intercourse from behind. Um, but, of course, the public enjoyed this immensely. And uh, Sparrow was perhaps a little disconcerted by the reaction because he was wrapped in gales of laughter. Alistair Forbes, I remember, said that the Warden of All Souls would now become known as the Warden of All Holes. And um, he didn't, I think, make his point because the trial was not, you know, about truth, and falsehood. It's about guilt and innocence, as all criminal trials are under British law. And the book that was on trial was not Lady Chatterley's Lover. It was really John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty. When I, when I think about the attitude to sex at that time, it was just beginning to change, just beginning to be a crucial period in English history and English literary history. When you just began to say what, you could say what you wanted to say, but you could still be prosecuted. 
And it was a dangerous moment for English literature. It was a dangerous moment when something appalling might have happened. If the trial had gone the other way, it would have been a disaster, a disaster to English literature, I think. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if, in fact, the verdict had gone the other way. Uh, I think that it would have eventually produced an explosion. I cannot think of a better vehicle for having um, come over the bridge into the world of sanity compared with the ritualistic, rigid and totally inflexible view which was still the hangover in England of the 1940s and 1950s from mid-Victorian times. I mean, it seems a remarkable thing to say so now, but it really was a watershed. Sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chatterley Band and the Beatles' first LP. Up till then, there'd only been a sort of bargaining, a wrangle for a ring, a shame that started at 16 and spread to everything. Then all at once the quarrel sank. Everyone felt the same, and every life became a brilliant breaking of the bank a quite unlosable game. So life was never better than in 1963, though just too late for me, between the end of the Chatley Band and the Beatles' first LP. Yeah, you find films are not particularly popular because I think everybody's read the books locally and uh, they've had enough. The feeling in Eastwood of, of D. H. Lawrence uh, is on the wane. Lots of people now don't associate with D. H. Lawrence. Um, the town's changed since the closing of the, the Colliers local. There's a different influx of people now, a different type of people, and the town's definitely changed. It's not quite so popular. We've never had anybody come in the shop and complain about the type of uh, films that we stock, but we do get the odd person that complains mainly because of swearing, not for sexual uh, content. Enjoy your presence. Please call again. At last, I begin to see the point of my critics' abuse of my exulting of sex. They only know one form of sex. In fact, to them, there is only one form of sex the nervous, personal, disintegrated sort, the white sex. And this, of course, is something to be flowery and false about, but nothing to be very hopeful about. I quite agree. And I quite agree. We can have no hope of a regeneration of England from such sort of sex. At the same time, I cannot see any hope of regeneration for a sexless England. An England that has lost its sex seems to me nothing to feel very hopeful about. And nobody feels very hopeful about it. So I may have been a fool for insisting on sex where the current sort of sex is just what I don't mean and don't want. Still, I can't go back on it all and believe in the regeneration of a, an England by pure sexlessness. A sexless England. Doesn't ring very hopeful to me. The Phoenix. 
Phoenix renews her youth only when she is burnt. Burnt alive. Burnt down to hot and flocculent ash. Then the small stirring of a new small bub in the nest with strands of down like floating ash shows that she is renewing her youth like the eagle. Immortal bird. Thank you.